I'm Sean Spear, the project director of the Ontario 360 project uh, here at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. Today we released uh, our first policy paper in the 2019-2020 um, season uh, on social assistance reform, which is an issue um, that the Ford government here in the province of Ontario uh, is committed to tackling to address uh, some of the ongoing challenges within Ontario's uh, income support programming. Uh, I'm so pleased to have the authors with me today, Noah Zahn and Thomas Granofsky, uh, who've produced uh, an, an insightful paper on, um, on the gaps and challenges within the system uh, and a set of concrete recommendations uh, to, to address them. We just had a, a policy breakfast session, uh, which enabled a free flow of discussion uh, on the paper and, and Noah and Thomas's uh, recommendations. And I'm pleased to have them here uh, to, to shed some light on the report uh, shed some light on uh, the system and ultimately how we can uh, improve it uh, to the betterment of the province of Ontario and most importantly uh, those people who, uh, who are presently uh, on Ontario Works or Ontario Dis Disabilities uh, Support Program. Noah and Thomas, thanks so much for having me. Uh, maybe as a, as a starting point, can you just uh, uh, give viewers a sense of, of where the um, uh, social assistance program uh, system is is failing and and where we ought to um, be focused in terms of uh, improvement sure i'll lead off and, and thomas sure. please uh, please jump in uh, so the social assistance is a is a program of last financial resort for for nearly a million ontarians and it faces an, a number of challenges in terms of meeting its goals of actually helping people meet their basic needs and succeed in, in transitioning into the labor market and, and building financial stability. And so some of the ways that social assistance falls short are uh, one major way is in connecting people to labor market. Uh, and so of the people who are uh, receiving Ontario Works and one of the two major pieces of, of social assistance, only about 10% move off of uh, social assistance into employment mm. in five years. Mm. And that is because of a number of barriers that they face. They face barriers in, in, in discrimination and access to good jobs in the labor market. They, the, they face barriers because the employment and training supports they're getting aren't working for them. And they face barriers because they actually face really high levels of taxation in making the choice to move off of social assistance and into the labor market. So some of those are some of the key gaps and challenges that we're focused on identifying in the system and trying to find some ways that the government can move forward in, in reform. And, and, and just to echo Noah, um, it's so important that we get the, these changes right because these are the most sort of vulnerable people mm. in our province and at the moment um, an, another sort of big gap is their their rates are very low so we're we're giving people an income that's uh, well below the poverty line um, and people are forced to sort of scramble to survive they're they're going uh, to food banks rather than uh, working on their well-being or, or or job searches one of the one of the things that uh, the, the paper uh, zeroes in on and something that Noah just zeroed in on uh, is if, if you start from the premise that the that the primary objective of the uh, social assistance system is to help people transition from deep financial need into employment mm -hmm. nine out of ten recipients of Ontario works over a five-year period are not are not part of that transition uh, it seems to me that is um, a, a, an evidence of systemic failure uh, and so the question is, uh, why? What's, what, in your view, is the, 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 the source of the failure? What are we doing wrong? Why aren't we better serving those who, as you say, are our most vulnerable? So maybe I can start on this. Um, we know that there's an enormous amount of red tape in the system. Um, so there are, there's paperwork for basically everything that you need to do in the system. There's monthly reporting requirements for any change in income. Uh, that's keeping caseworkers and clients busy doing paperwork rather than the work that they need to be doing to uh, look for jobs, uh, maybe find people housing, uh, other supports that people need. So we know that's an incredible waste of the time. It's an incredible waste of government resources as well. And we'd, we'd like to see some changes that would free up um, people's time to actually be doing productive activities. And when you think about how people are spending their time and whether they have free time to, uh, to uh, find work, to, to engage in training, to do the things that are going to improve their lives, we also have to look at the inadequacy of benefits. And so in uh, a single adult uh, is eligible on Ontario Works for up to 
$730 a month. That's about $25 a day. And as a result of the fact that that's not enough to get by, people are forced to, uh, for example, go to, from food bank to food bank to, as basic survival activities. So that's also taking up people's time mm -hmm. and energy to focus on survival rather than moving into financial stability. And on the question of benefit adequacy, which the paper highlights as an, as an area uh, requiring attention, mm -hmm. can you just elaborate on um, the different ways that the government may go about addressing the adequacy of benefits? Um, I think when people hear that, they instinctively assume you mean that the base benefit in Ontario Works or on uh, ODSP needs to increase, and that may be one approach, but the paper outlines um, various other ways to ensure that on a system-wide basis, um, people have the right mix of income supports and other benefits and other supports uh, to, one, um, um, ensure that their basic needs are being met, but more fundamentally, that they're in a position to actually move, uh, ultimately, from welfare to work. Yeah, so when you think about uh, the adequacy of of benefits in people's lives, we have to look beyond just social assistance benefits. And social assistance is actually just one eighth of the income security system that's avail in, in dollars and cents terms that's available to Ontarians. And so that includes a whole bunch of other programs like employment insurance, Canada Pension Plan, uh, WSIB, uh, and child benefits. And so you can address people's adequacy. When you think about people's adequacy, it's not necessarily about the social assistance rates. It's about what they're getting from the income security program and from the broader social safety net. Including? Including child care subsidies, including, including uh, access to social housing. And so you can address people's costs and people's, the adequacy of whether they're able to meet the basic needs to, to succeed and build a stable, uh, build a stable life by whether you address a variety of these needs. And one of the recommendations that we make is around improving access to health benefits, which is not about cash in your pocket, but mm -hmm. it's about whether you have the adequate set of services and insurance to, to succeed. And just building on that, um, eventually we'd like to see some of these benefits, health, housing, moved a bit outside of the social assistance system because they can function as a financial cliff for families that are exiting social assistance, uh, it can increase their uh, marginal effective tax rates to a point that's prohibitive. It's, it's a disincentive to work. And so if we move these out of the system, um, we can help to smooth these marginal effective tax rates that people are, are impacted by. And, and, and hopefully they, they don't feel that that has a psychological barrier uh, to moving into employment. If we that. could just dwell on that for a second, Thomas, because I think it's such a critical insight of the paper. Uh, you know, I said at the beginning, that the basic premise of the program uh, is that we are helping people transition from deep financial need into employment. And that basic premise is actually broadly, uh, widely viewed as the right premise. Uh, people may disagree on the design of particular programs and so on, but really from the left to the right, we all agree that the ultimate goal of social assistance needs to be ultimately the transition into work. Now, you're saying that even in spite of that premise, uh, a bit counterintuitively, that the program can function in a way that actually discourages work or disincentivizes work, and this comes in the form of what you refer to as marginal effective tax rates. Do you guys mind just elaborating on first what marginal effective tax rates are, how they're embedded in the system, and, and what policymakers here in the province of Ontario might do to remove these disincentives or at least minimize the disincentives for work and ultimately put the system on a path that is more consistent with the overall objective of transitioning from welfare to work. So uh, let's talk about what, what we're trying to get at with this concept of marginal effective tax rates, which can be a bit of a wonky term, but it's really about looking at how much tax you pay on, every, on the next dollar that you make. And we talk about marginal tax rates because we think, a pretty large body of economic uh, research says, it matters how much tax you're going to pay, how much you're going to be able to take home of every next dollar that you earn uh, to, to incentivize what, what choices you're going to make, but of course also how much you actually get to keep. Let's just, let's just think concretely for that. Let's um, take a, um, an archetype. Um, so someone is receiving Ontario Works right now. Um, and he or she is also receiving other benefits around health care, for instance, maybe housing, uh, and they're offered a job. 
Uh, now, you would think that the system's goal would be to make it easy for that person to say yes. Um, but presently, because of the interaction between their employment income from that job and their access to uh, cash payments from Ontario Works, but also other benefits, may cause them to, to actually lose out. In fact, in the paper, you observe that the marginal effective tax rate they may face because of the interaction between employment income and their access to other program could exceed 50%, and in some instances, even 100%. So in other words, every dollar they earn from work represents a loss of at least a dollar or maybe more. I think all viewers uh, and um, people uh, following these issues would recognize that that's an inherently flawed system that works at cross purposes with the uh, stated objectives yeah. of the program. So how, how does this happen and what can we do about it? I mean, let's come back to that concrete example. Let's say you're, you're receiving Ontario Works and you're not working right now, you're in deep financial need. You get a job opportunity. Right now, every month, you get to keep the first 200 bucks you earn. Hmm. That's about three hours a week at minimum wage. So anything beyond that, you start paying back at a minimum 50 cents on the dollar of your Ontario Works payments. Then on top of that, let's say you also live in rent geared to income social housing. Now not only are you paying 50 cents on the dollar of your, uh, of your income back to the government to repay the on social assistance benefits you received, you're now also seeing your rent go up by 30 cents on every dollar that you earn because your rent is geared yes. to income and targeted at 30%. So now you're seeing these tax rates scale up and scale up. And you also start to face the risk of losing if you are no longer eligible for social assistance, access to other benefits, especially health benefits. And if you have any complicated health concern or you're worried that you might end up with one in the future, then that risk of losing access to drug coverage or other health benefits that you get through social assistance is a pretty big risk. Yes. Yeah, and it's worth noting that all these changes to your income, it's your responsibility to report these on a monthly yes. basis to your caseworker, uh, which is another sort of onerous bit of paperwork that you need to do. Um, but it also means that there's going to be fluctuations in your income. Yes. So lots of people go off the system, they come back on again, they go off again multiple times during a year. That makes financial household planning really difficult. Yes. Um, one of the recommendations that we made in the paper was uh, an expansion or standardization of some of the transitional health benefits that are currently available uh, to people who are receiving OW or ODSP. As one means of trying to smooth out yeah. the fluctuations that you're talking about and in turn the imposition of a high marginal effective tax rate. This is a complicated issue. Uh, and we're not going to be able to resolve it here, um, but I think it's fair to say that it is one of the most important questions facing the government as it grapples with how to reform the system to better deliver on the objective of helping people transition to employment. If I could just ask one final question, I, 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 I'm, I'm sensitive that we've taken a lot of your time today, um, but one of the most important observations in the paper, and one that seems to resonate um, uh, with people, including, um, in, including policymakers in the province of Ontario, uh, is a kind of simple concept, but embedded in it is some deep insights. And that is that the system is increasingly uh, uh, guided by the principal accountability on the part of the individual recipients, um, um, but less on the accountability of the system. Um, can you just elaborate on the, the basic idea and why you think a rebalancing of how we think about accountability is ultimately um, fundamental to uh, in, improving outcomes uh, for Ontarians? Yeah, sure, I can start with that. Um, so we know, obviously, there is a very small amount of fraud in the system, um, and I think that we spend an inordinate and disproportionate amount of energy uh, trying to prevent that and, and chase that down. Uh, in terms of the objectives of the system, uh, really we want to move people into employment. The objective of the system is not to make sure there's zero percent fraud, um, but we are spending a vast amount of energy trying to prevent fraud, and we'd like to see a shift in the onus of accountability. So um, right now, yes, the, the onus is on the client, they are forced to do all this uh, reporting, and, and the system looks more similar to probation than it does, uh, for example, the tax system. Mm -hmm. um, now, what we could see with an, an outcomes-based uh, model is we could see program managers and case managers taking on the responsibility for the results of the system 
rather than asking the clients to go through all these hurdles um, simply to prove that they're not doing anything wrong. Mm -hmm. it, it's a bit ironic when you think of it. You, you know, we talked at the beginning about uh, the system's failure to deliver on its primary objective and yet so much of the attention is, is paid to making individuals yeah. that accountable, yeah. arguably at the expense of the system holding itself to account on its capacity uh, to deliver on its, on its own objective. And I think um, um, reconceptualizing the question of accountability would manifest itself in various policy reforms, particularly in and around uh, red tape and reporting. Yeah, I mean, as a condition of, of, of receiving benefits from the program, particularly for Ontario Works, you have to agree in these participation agreements to participate in all sorts of activities that your caseworker might determine, and those might include structured job search activities or participating in certain kinds of training. The problem is a lot of what we make people do doesn't work, and all of that cost is borne by the recipients, and, and, none, and none of that accountability comes on, on the system of what we are requiring people to do, even mm -hmm. though it's not working. Mm -hmm. Well, we're grateful um, that you contributed to the Ontario 360 project. Uh, as I said at the outset, this is the first in a series of papers over the, the coming weeks and months uh, to try to help the government as it grapples with these important policy questions facing our province. Uh, and and uh, we'll, hopefully the conversation will continue. We expect the government to uh, unveil a set of reforms to social assistance in the coming weeks and months. And hopefully um, your paper is, has contributed to the government's thinking. I think if the government um, uh, is open to the insights and analysis, it will um, lead to a smarter, more effective reform. So, so thank you so much for your contribution and, and uh, we'll look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you, John. Thank you very much.